could be one of those doom and gloom environmental documentaries filled with burning rainforests and devastating hurricanes. But it's not. This could be one of those educational science videos where experts debate the causes of climate change from the safety of their offices high above the floodplain. Or even more experts arguing about whether global warming or climate change is the right way to talk about what's going on. Nope. If your house is burning, you don't argue about who started it or whether it's called a blaze or an inferno. You put out the fire. Okay, I gotta admit, it doesn't seem like my house is burning, but the overwhelming consensus among scientists is that global warming is a serious threat. And if we don't do something about it today, it's only gonna get worse. So we're looking for solutions, real solutions, that scientists and engineers are working on right now. Ideas and technologies that could solve the problems, but also boost the economy and improve our quality of life. You've probably heard about carbon. Carbon's the problem. There's too much carbon in the atmosphere. But carbon is a basic building block of life. It's in plants and trees and animals, even in you. That's right, if someone squeezed all the water out of you, ugh, most of what would be left would be carbon. Since carbon is in just about every living thing, it's also in just about every dead thing that was once living like all those plants and animals that turned into oil, coal, and natural gas over millions of years. The fossil fuels. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that when we burn those fossil fuels, what we get, in addition to a lot of energy, is carbon dioxide, or CO2. Just by burning oil, coal, and natural gas, we're putting about 80 million tons of CO2 into the air every day. It's about 30 billion tons a year. The sun's rays pass through the carbon dioxide and hit the Earth. Some of the high-frequency sunlight is then reflected back as low-frequency infrared heat. A portion of the infrared is absorbed by carbon dioxide. There's so much more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more heat is being retained, warming the Earth's atmosphere and surface. Now, carbon dioxide has been part of our atmosphere for billions of years. It's what we breathe out. <clears throat> but putting extra CO2 in the atmosphere is a problem because the extra CO2 is trapping more heat than we, and the environment we need to survive, are used to. Fossil fuels did occur naturally, but the problem is we're burning them unnaturally fast. We're burning it at a rate of a million times faster than it was created. The 10 hottest years on record have all occurred since 1998. And if we don't put on the brakes on reducing CO2 and get it under control, we will see a different planet. We will have a different society. We're talking about social and economic chaos, not just climate chaos. If the problem is too much carbon in the atmosphere, well, then the obvious solution is stop putting it there. Stop burning it. Then see what we can do to take some of the carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere. Right now, 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. And if we're going to solve the CO2 problem, we basically have to go to zero. We're acting like our planet is disposable and using the atmosphere as a waste dump, and we just have to stop. Climate change is very real. It is very serious. Uh, it is already happening. It's not a theory. It is a fact. It's not just that we're warming the Earth system. It's that we're doing so now at a pace that far exceeds anything we have seen in the natural progression in the past. We are essentially running thousands to tens of thousands of years of history in just a few years in real time here. Human beings respond to shocks. The lights have got to go out, or we're going to have an energy disaster or a war or something. But then we react quickly and things happen. We got into this situation because of the way we use energy. And the way we use energy is how we're going to get ourselves out of it. 
This is a country, more than any other country in the world, that has its founding ethos around inventiveness. The real irony is that while the scale of change that we are bringing to the planet is huge, the opportunity for solutions, many of which are pretty easy, is actually right in front of us. This is what America does better than anybody else in the world. We need to focus on that strength. That's going to be critical to becoming a great nation once again. But how easy is all this? That's a bit of a puzzle. Some of the biggest wind farms in the world are here in Denmark. But what did it take to get them built? First of all, you need a green policy to support wind energy. Not too much because nobody is going to grow fat for wind energy, but enough so people can invest in this. Today, the largest offshore wind farm is here in Denmark, in the west coast. It is an offshore wind farm with 96 turbines, and it produces enough electricity to 200,000 Danish households. We have a fixed price for the electricity for 10 years. This was good enough for private investors to say, yes, we, we want to be a part of this. Because the Danish government guaranteed a good price for renewable energy over a fixed period of time, both individuals and corporations were able to invest with confidence. It's a simple idea that's made a huge difference in the way this country generates its power. We started the first offshore wind farm in 91. Then later on, the British took over the first place with just a slightly larger offshore wind farm. And now the lead is back here in Denmark. It's a race where everybody wins. I think the US should uh, come join the race. To be fair, the US has more wind turbines than any other country. It's just that as a percentage of total energy needs, it's still pretty small. Wind power is the fastest growing and the largest share of the new renewables in many markets. It can be incredibly low cost. It's one that you can deploy in ways where the farmers or the landowners can get rents from wind as well as the energy. Wind is relatively economic in certain locations where, where there's high winds. Uh, but it turns out that each wind turbine takes out over half of the energy flowing through that wind turbine. So if we try running civilization off of wind power, we get major climate effects just from a scale up of wind power. The United States could be more than 20% wind in about two decades. 20% is good, but obviously not enough. And if we start doing more than 20%, we risk changing the climate in yet another way. It's kind of freaky. So, what else is out there? One of the technologies getting a great deal of well-deserved attention right now is solar. And solar comes in a lot of flavors. The classic solar panels that we're used to, the photovoltaics, are one of the most expensive technologies today. Some of the other technologies in the solar field are as exciting as well. New entrants not only give us more competition in the field, but they open up new opportunities. The photoelectric effect that generates electricity from a solar panel really only requires sunlight and a single atom. And yet when we think about a solar panel, a crystalline one, we're thinking about a lot of material, both a lot of silicon, a layer of glass on top, a layer of metal behind. It's about an inch thick sandwich of stuff to get that current out. The idea of thin film is that if we can do this with a very thin layer of atoms, we reduce the amount of materials and it's the cost dramatically. There's a whole other side of solar, which is solar thermal systems. What we're doing now is simply concentrating sunlight on a device that will heat up and we're gonna harvest the heat out of the back end of that. You know, enough sun hits the Earth every hour to power the planet for a year. The trick is capturing that power efficiently and profitably. This is a field of approximately 6,000 mirrors. Sunlight hits these mirrors. The mirrors reflect the sunlight to the tower. And at the tower, we focus all the mirrors, boil water, produce steam, and then we use that steam collect it into a power block where we're spinning a normal steam turbine generator, just like you'd find in any energy facility around the world. The trick is we've got to move this mirror over the course of the day so that it's always reflecting the sunlight into the tower. 
And we do that with 12,000 mirrors simultaneously to hit each of our towers. Oh, it just moved. There it goes. Whoa. Cool. That's pretty responsive software. That's right. I mean, basically, the accuracy with which we need to point this mirror in front of us is equivalent to taking a BB pellet and throwing it in a drinking straw from about 10 feet away. We do that 12,000 times every minute, every day of the year. How do you explain this project to your great aunt or your grandma? Basically, I tell her that um, um, I've built a very, very large tea kettle. How cost effective is this concentrated solar facility? Well, our goal at eSolar is to be able to compete with fossil fuels directly without subsidies. And we're not there yet, but this plan is the first step uh, in our company's progress to essentially being able to replace fossil fuel fired facilities in most markets in the world. So you're talking cheaper than coal? Eventually, yes. What's it going to take to get there? Uh, it's going to take deploying it on a large scale. Um, fossil fuel technologies uh, have been around for over 100 years. Uh, you know, mankind has been burning everything that we can get our hands on to produce energy for the past millennia. And right now, this is a technology that's just arrived on the world stage. And the more we build, the cheaper it gets and the more cost effective it becomes. All of the things you see here in the mirror field can be built by two people using four socket wrenches and one Phillips head screwdriver. It's extremely fast to deploy and very cost effective to build. If you were to take our technology and build a square about 90 miles by 90 miles on a side, that one power plant would produce enough energy to power all of the United States. What's the downside of this type of energy production? Well, all solar energy right now is a little handicapped because if the sun's not shining, it's not producing electricity. Solar thermal in particular does have the ability to store heat and then use that heat to deliver energy when the sun isn't shining. And that's a path that I think all the solar thermal technologies are eventually headed to. It's just cool looking. Is this like Area 51 around here? I mean, you got a bunch of mirrors and crazy bright lights. No, everybody knows that aliens only come at night, so we don't have that problem here. So how much could advanced solar reduce carbon emissions? When the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing, you still want your refrigerator to run, you want to be able to use your computer. We're going to have to have a mix. It's expensive and there are issues with storage or transmission, but there's nothing physically preventing us from scaling up solar power as large as we want to scale it. Problems with solar and wind, they're not predictable, but the tides, they are. <laughs> Bet you could have predicted that. Northern Ireland. Not a place where solar energy makes a lot of sense, but if you're by the ocean, you got water. Since 2008, here in Strangford Law, Marine Current Turbines has been operating the world's first commercial scale underwater tidal turbine, producing 1.2 megawatts of predictable renewable electricity. You can't see the rotors, but under there are two big 16 meter diameter rotors. They're the biggest rotating objects in the sea in the world. As the water goes through, those rotors are turning. So the way to visualize it is it's an underwater wind turbine. Well, why not just put the turbines above? What, what's the difference between the water and the air moving well, the rotors? What you've got with the water is, first of all, it's 800 times as dense. So you have a huge amount of energy embedded in it. But with tidal energy, it's also totally predictable. So as long as we continue moving around the sun and the moon goes around us, you can set your watch by this energy. You know when it's going to run, you know how much will be there and how much you can capture. What are the biggest issues with this type of a production? I mean, what were the barriers to entry? This seems like a pretty oh, big... Oh gosh, there, like there, there are a myriad of them. The, the biggest technical challenge is not actually the machine, but it's how you fix it to the seabed. Now you see behind us, that structure there. The, the way to think of it is at the moment it's experiencing the, the effect of about a 300 knot wind. Right? That's the way to think of it. So how do you stay there to fix this to the seabed? We think it's an engineering marvel. It's the biggest marine renewable energy device in the world. It's manifestly there. It's real. It's producing power. It's produced the most power of anything out there. 
You know, people want the silver bullet, the magic pill that's going to be the total solution. Is this a 5% solution, a 10% solution? It's a 10% or a 15% solution. It may be more for certain, com for certain countries. It might be quite big in Canada. It won't necessarily be big in the States. It's just where the resource is. Can you do it without government incentives? No, because we're competing with fully commoditized fossil fuel technology. And it doesn't pay for the damage it's doing. It's very uncomplicated. We're only subsidized because no one's got the guts to actually tax the people doing the pollution. If they did that, we'd be quids in straight away, I promise you. <laughs> I could ask you what the environmental impact was on marine mammals and fish. But the real well, question is, are cod and haddock getting cuisinarded down there? No, 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 no. This is the idea of you think, well, you maybe think, it's not like putting your finger in a desk fan, right? These rotors are not driving the water. They are being driven by the water. So the whole flow of the water going through is completely different to something driving it. And so it's very difficult for anything to actually touch them. You know, it looks with that bow wake like a boat pushing through the water. And I half anticipate that it's making the same noises we're hearing on our boat. I'm... No, no? quiet. OK, I'm, I'm going to test this theory. Jeremy, will you cut the engine up there? I want to listen. Just a little bit of the sound of water. Which is the wake. You're just hearing the surface there as it goes past the pile. But underneath you, there's nothing. My father was a fisherman here for 40 years, fishing scallops and prawns. So as I was growing up, I was along with him. What do you think when they said they were going to put a big turbine to harness the power of the tides right in the middle of the entrance to the lock? At the time, there was a lot of worry about the seals uh, and the, the porpoises, what? the seals, the, the great, the seals, seals, seals. I have to get my American seals, seals. <laughs> Since CGN has been there, they're just avoiding it. They're going around the outside of it and then going back into the middle of the channel again and swimming on as per usual. The seals are very curious. Uh, you notice that a seal rubbing itself against CGN within a day of it being put in place. So, so it's just a back scratch for them. Back scratcher. In California, more energy is produced by geothermal than wind and solar combined. Now, most of these facilities tap into steam from naturally occurring geysers, but newer technology is looking at drilling more widely and injecting water into the Earth's crust. Geothermal power, by current estimates, could reach 10% or more of all electricity if we are willing to drill deep enough pipes under most of our cities to extract that heat from a mile or more down in the Earth's crust. Very exciting, could be low cost, and it's baseload, it's always on. The downside is that we're seeing a number of companies now exploring for new geothermal and they're triggering earthquakes. So not only is the exploration expensive, but in some places that could be a real problem. And we've already seen earthquakes at geothermal facilities in Switzerland and in California, and that's a pretty big downside. What else? What about, dare I say, nuclear power? Here, in fact, is the answer to a dream as old as man himself, a giant of limitless power at man's command. And where was it science found that giant? In the atom. Nuclear has the big advantage that it's no carbon emitted when you're running the plant, and it's always on. The downside is that nuclear power plants have become incredibly expensive. And that's even before we get to the issues about waste management and proliferation, which add to the cost and also add to the risk of having this technology as part of our mix. It's fairly capital intensive to start a new nuclear program. And it's a very long time frame to get the regulatory approvals and the building permits and the siting. One of the problems with the nuclear power, obviously, is it creates some waste. Well, one of the problems with coal plants is they create a huge amount of waste up in the sky in a place that you can't control it and that creates global warming. The advantages to nuclear power is that it creates a smaller amount of waste that we have control of, that you can reprocess it like the French do to massively reduce the amount of it, 
and we can contain it. We would love to invest in nuclear power, but we're having a hard time finding the startup company tinkering in their garage with a fusion reactor. It's not the perfect energy source, but there is no perfect energy source. Our great hope is that the price of solar energy comes down as fast as possible, and then we've got an unlimited amount of energy and we don't have to store carbon and we don't have to fuse uranium. Okay, so nuclear seems to be on hold, at least until we can deal with the cost and the waste. You may have noticed that all of the alternative energy sources we talked about so far create electricity. Great, but what do we do with it? How do we store it? And the big challenge, transportation. How do we take electricity out on the road? Electric vehicles offer a way to uh, transition transportation from burning completely oil to using electricity, which can be supplied by green technologies such as wind or solar or things that don't encompass any CO2 at all. Electric vehicles are fun to drive. You get all the power right away and consumers are going to start to buy these cars for reasons other than just, hey, I don't have to go to the gas station. The Roadster is able to break perceptions on what people think EVs can do. We can accelerate 0 to 60 in under 3.8 seconds. That's quicker than any car you can buy right now at almost any price point. On top of that, it has a range of you know, about 250 miles. How close is battery technology to being as good as it gets? You know, batteries are changing at an amazing clip. They're doubling in their ability to store energy in a given amount of weight and volume about every 10 years. Costs today are very expensive, but as we start to make tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of electric or hybrid electric vehicles, the cost drops significantly in the ranges that you'd expect a mass market consumer to be able to afford. Let's just start at the beginning. You're making these batteries from scratch. From scratch. We start with the raw materials, some powder, carbon, lithium manganese oxide, and various other chemicals mix it together with a binder and some solvents, and that becomes the slurry. We have two types, one for a negative and one for a positive, and later on we'll marry those two together and make a battery. And slurry is exactly that. It's a, a mixture of uh, aqueous and powdered material. I think I had that at Dairy Queen once. It could, could it very the, well be. Maybe it was a mixed slurry, <laughs> I can't remember. We're just at the very beginning there. We've made our first major technology leap as we've moved lithium ion from cell phones into automotive and advanced energy storage applications. But we're just scratching the surface on the advanced materials and advanced chemistries that we have available. Why is this a big deal? Well, it's a very big deal. We're eliminating the, the use of foreign oil because we're getting rid of the use of gasoline, especially when you go to electrification of vehicles. Less gas, more jobs, more growth. It's a tremendous win-win for everybody. The battery industry, the lithium battery industry, is based out of Southeast Asia. For us to be able to bring that technology and that industry into you know, central Indiana or into the United States uh, really brings a lot of job power to the United States. I was looking for a job. We had lost a contract and I was out of work. And when I came here, I was given the opportunity. I don't consider myself an environmentalist. I drive a vehicle that probably doesn't get the best gas mileage, but I want, I want to make sure that I'm doing what I can to help my children and their children and their grandchildren. As they grow up and see how the new electric vehicles, I can tell them dad was one of the first to you know, make the new electric vehicles for the hybrid and you know, so on and so on. And so yeah, it'd be great for the kids. For us, a great story for me to tell my kids. It's one of those things that the arena that I grew up in, we're farmers. We gotta take care of this world and I wanna see them batteries in my tractor one of these days. Plus I drive a little scooter. I wanna see that in there too. <laughs> For anyone who thought electric vehicles couldn't get decent range or serious performance, let me tell you, these things are for real. Another option for zero emission transportation is hydrogen fuel cells. Like a battery, a fuel cell provides electricity to an electric motor. Hydrogen fuel cells, give me a brief explanation. Fuel cells in some ways are pretty simple. Um, the key concept to understand is there's a membrane in each fuel cell. They're kind of like sandwiches. And the meat of the sandwich is called a, a membrane that allows ions like protons to go through it, but electrons can't go through it. It's an electronic insulator. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I was not... told there would be no chemistry here. <laughs> the movement of electrons is electricity. And so we're making electrons move 
to, from where they're provided to where they're needed. And in doing so, they're powering the electric motor by taking this path around the membrane. Okay, I think I got it. Inside a fuel cell, hydrogen from a tank combines with oxygen from the air to produce water, H2O, and enough energy to power a bus. While it currently takes hours to charge a battery, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles can be refueled in minutes. On the other hand, fuel cells are even more expensive than batteries. And hydrogen stations? That would mean a whole new infrastructure. In places like California, where we have lots of off-peak wind power that we really don't uh, find very useful, we could make hydrogen with that off-peak wind power and it could be very economically competitive. But electric vehicles are only just starting to go into mass production. So in the meantime, how do I power my minivan? Biofuels are liquid fuels made from plants instead of petroleum. Now with enough refining, they can theoretically run in your existing car's engine. But of course, all that refining takes energy. And harvesting the plant material, it's called biomass. That takes even more energy, plus it takes water and land. It's hard to know how other than jet fuel you're going to really economically fly jets around. And so maybe we'll make jet fuels out of biofuels. But in terms of a broad solution to the transportation system or our energy system generally, biofuels just takes up too much land area. Biofuels are really a tricky category. There are some opportunities to replace oil with biofuels that look incredibly attractive. Growing algae, even algae that uses carbon dioxide as its feedstock, so it could be placed at current power plants as a way to get rid of its CO2. If you're making fuels from corn, that's just ridiculous. And uh, when you shift algae, the, the, the equation balances much better. But on the other hand, biofuels have some real serious issues that have not been well addressed yet. Ecosystems typically convert only about a half a percent of the sunlight into organic matter, into biomass that can be then converted into biofuels. All that processing takes more energy. If we think of a solar cell, it might be 20% efficient. That's 40 times more energy per unit area than biomass. In other words, plants are basically solar collectors. But unfortunately, they're not as efficient at converting solar energy into power as the solar cells we already know how to make. So it seems like advanced biofuels are well worth researching, but they're just not ready for prime time yet. If you want to get off the petrochemical economy, if you want no oil drilled from the ground, you're going to have to use algae, yeast, and bacteria to do your bidding. This is the way the planet's done it for millions of years, and it's the way we'll do it in the future, and it is achievable, and it's something we can achieve in the next 20 years. So in the meantime, we need to use less fossil fuels by using less energy. But can you do that without negatively affecting your lifestyle? I mean, what if I don't want to carpool with my neighbors, or I don't want to turn down the heat? We're not going to solve this problem without becoming more efficient. So efficiency is a key part of this solution. There's a big difference between efficiency and conservation. President Carter promoted both of them, but he got known for suffering by sitting by the fireplace with a sweater on. That's really not what efficiency is all about. It's about getting the same or better services with less energy. It's about getting more for your money not finding ways to suffer a bit and, and conserve. The technology is there. We know how to build buildings much more efficient. We know how to go in and retrofit a building, which means how to put in more insulation, how to change out a refrigerator, how to make the furnace more efficient. We just haven't done it. And energy efficiency is remarkably easy. You can make an 80 or 90 percent reduction in the energy use of a light bulb by going straight from a traditional incandescent to an LED light in Denmark, in California, in New York, in Wisconsin, in Rhode Island. We've already seen that you can reduce your peak energy demand by 30 or 40 or more percent. We could probably cut our energy use by 50 percent or more just by making efficiency job one. When people ask me, are we sort of reaching the upper limits of where we can go with energy efficiency, I, I am adamant, no. We're barely scratching the surface on the type of savings we can get from energy efficiency. Suppose all of the alternative fuels and the electric cars and the increased efficiencies help us stop putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 
well, what about all the CO2 we've already put into the atmosphere over the last 300 years? What do we do about all that? Even if we were to freeze greenhouse gas concentrations today, the Earth would continue to warm for many decades. And so even if we don't build another carbon dioxide emitting device today, we have all of the existing devices that will continue heating up the planet. One idea is to capture CO2, either from power plants or directly out of the air. And Klaus Lachner is working with materials that do just that. Capturing CO2 from air is a little bit what trees do. And in a way, the first half of the problem is nearly identical. You have a real tree, and it has leaves, or in the case of a pine tree, it has needles, and the wind blows over those surfaces, and as the wind blows over it, these surfaces hang on to the CO2, which was in the air. And so here we do the very same thing on this synthetic pine tree, if you reach, these are the needles, uh, and as the air moves through there, it actually absorbs CO2. These things are about a thousand times as fast in collecting CO2 than a real tree. You can imagine a whole forest of synthetic trees. But capturing the CO2 is only half of the problem. The next question, what do you do with all of it? Norway's Stadoil Hydro project has been injecting CO2 under the seabed for over a decade. And a project in Iceland is looking at speeding up a natural chemical process of turning CO2 gas into a solid carbonate, something like limestone. Even if these initial demonstration projects work, the scale of the problem is mind-boggling. The energy required to do carbon capture, in many cases, it's about a third of the energy required to run the plant in the first place which means that if you needed a mile-long train of coal to run a plant before, now you need a 1.3 mile-long train of coal to do the same job. And coal mining is environmentally damaging in its own right. Every American is producing roughly 22 tons of CO2 a year. And if you turn that into a carbonate, you have a big pile of sand in your front yard. So you have to do something with it. In other areas, we are used to this. You don't let sewage just run out in the river anymore. We know we have to pay for it. And I don't think we have a choice to do this here any other way. The image of people's carbon dioxide piling up in the front lawn, that's pretty powerful. And if you could touch and see the problem like that, I think things would change a lot faster. The big part of the energy equation that we don't talk about very much is the transmission distribution system, the grid. It is the highway of energy, whether it's dirty or clean energy. And right now we have, in most parts of the world, neglected the grid to a point that's really embarrassing. There's a lot of technology that is available that can make that transmission system operate a lot more efficiently. And we just as a country have not invested in that technology. We need infrastructure. The existing infrastructure was built for the fossil fuel industries. They've had 100 years to build out that infrastructure. If we're going to attack this problem with the robustness that, that, that the times demand of, uh, with, with the pressures of climate change and energy security, we need infrastructure that is built for it. You want the electricity to stay on. If you notice that your power goes out for a few hours, you're, you're upset. There's, you know, your refrigerator, your lights, you, we're very dependent on electricity. As we've seen, much of the technology to prevent climate change already exists, and it can be profitable too. So now communities in Europe and the US are working to put the pieces together. Years ago, the Danish government sponsored a contest. Which community could come up with the best plan for becoming carbon neutral? Well, SAMSO won. And now, they're generating more power than they're using. Jorgen Tranberg is a dairy farmer and a wind farmer. I have uh, this wind turbine there. This one produced for nearly 500 families. Do you produce milk for that many people? Oh, yes, we produce uh, 4,000 
thousand liters every day. I have 150 uh, milking cows also. How do you think of yourself? Are you primarily a farmer or an electricity producer? No, I'm quite sure a farmer. So if you decide to do wind, how long till it was up and running? Six months. Six months? That's faster than nuclear power. That takes 10 years. Wow. This year takes five hours to build. They come at seven o'clock in the morning and at two o'clock they was finished. Five and hours to put this up? Yes. That's it? It's better to have wind turbines than send your son to Iraq for, to get the oil, you see. I think that's better. Wind's not the only piece of the puzzle here on Samso. There are also four central heating plants that act as collective furnaces for hundreds of people. The caretaker puts on the uh, straw bales on this long conveyor belt. The straw gets pushed onto a grid and then it gets burned and it heats up water. So it heats the water and then where does the water go? The water goes into big pipes, seven kilometers of transmission pipes to two villages, one uh, downhill and one uphill here. And uh, then the houses are connected to the big pipes with small pipes. So each, uh, there's 260 houses connected and uh, they get their heat from the big transmission pipes. So this is local straw, field waste. And like any plant, it captured carbon as it grew and that would normally go back into the air anyway as it decomposed or was burned in the field. But instead of wasting it, you're putting it to use. Yes, yes. People like to save. And it's been good fun to uh, use different, uh, to find out what's the best way to heat up your own house. What do you mean good fun? Who thinks of energy creation as good fun? Uh, as long as it saves money, it's good fun. <laughs> so where are we? We're in the boiler room. I have and, to tell you, we are in, you know, the Nordic countries here. This feels a lot like a sauna, and it smells yes, like one. Yes, it's uh, a little cold for a sauna, but um, we can take our clothes off if you want. <laughs> <laughs> this is Brian Kerr. He's an electrician here in Samso, and I've come here to see what kind of a setup you have for alternative energy at your home. Um, walk me through it, starting with the big turbine. Yeah, this is the, the turbine I've put up uh, two years ago. Uh, I have uh, solar panels over here on my house. I get my hot water from it all summer. I also have a pellet burner, which I use when there isn't any wind. And that's for heating? That's for my heating, yes. What does your wife say about the whole system? Does she, does she have any complaints or annoyances? Does it change her lifestyle? Uh, she hopes I'm never dying. <laughs> she will never know what, what, how it's working. But uh, now she is looking out the window to see if the turbine is, is running to, to see. Then she saves uh, money. I roughly get 25 to, to 30,000 Danish krona per year huh. from this installation. Turbine, pulse burner and all. So you pay nothing? I pay nothing. And you make between five and six thousand US dollars a year? Roughly, yes. Sweet ride. Yeah, this is my wife's car. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all electric? This is all electric. It has uh, batteries for capable for driving about 60 to 70 kilometers. Huh. So just a run around, just to zip down to town, zip back. Yeah, my wife, wife uses it every day to, to go to work. And I know that she really uses this because there's bread in the front seat. Yeah. This is for real. They really use this. This is really great. In one household, you're putting all the pieces together. Free power, free heat, even a free ride. The lessons of Samso, well, first, it worked. They totally changed the way that they create and consume power. And then, how it happened. I mean, government created an environment that facilitated change, but it was really from the people. They decided that they wanted something different. The question really is, if they can do it here, can we do it in the United States? Just before
before 10 p.m. on May 4, 2007, the town of Greensburg, Kansas was struck by a tornado. 11 people died and 95% of the buildings here were destroyed. The people in this small town lost everything. As I got up, walked up the upstairs a little ways, the whole wall was gone on part of, the, on part of that and then the whole, everything, through this sky above that. Uh, the town is about 1.2 miles wide and the storm was 1.7 miles wide and it took out 95% of the town the structures, the homes, the businesses. The crisis that happened here was so severe, it really woke people up. The idea is to become a model green community for the whole nation. The uh, courthouse has been completely remodeled. My new city hall down there, the, the spaceship looking building is very unique. It, We've taken 50,000 brick from our old power plant uh, to put on that building and we have solar panels and tremendous amount of natural lighting and passive solar and we've got, we have geothermal wells going in at each one of our facilities. I mean, we're taking the new Greensburg in a better way. When you were thinking about how to rebuild, why did you choose green? Well, I think people need to understand that in, in rural America, environment means everything. I mean. Um, they may not call themselves green, but they're very sustainable. I hate writing money to utility companies. I just, I like to keep my money in my pocket. This is an all electric house so with the geothermal and the tightness of the house, uh, we're saving about $200 a month in energy cost. If a small town of 900 people in Kansas can live sustainably, anyone in America can live sustainably. We ended up getting into the energy, wind energy business. Uh, out of the tornadoes that took us apart, the very winds that tore us apart have been putting us back together. The reason so is for us is maybe a little more passionate because of what happened to us. Uh, we were drug in it and uh, we had to survive. We're in the process of putting up a community wind farm in cooperation with uh, John Deere Renewables. We'll be able to generate through 10 towers, uh, 12 and a half megawatts of electricity that will power the whole town of Greensburg with sustainable, renewable wind energy. And the balance of that will be put on the grid through the Kansas Power Pool that the 13 other member cities will say that part of their portfolio is wind generated. Whose land are we on? Uh, stop. <laughs> I don't know. That's all right. You want me to go get my map? No, that's okay. I know. Are, we on, are we on a private farm? Yes, yes. The farmers in this area have leased this ground to the John Deere Renewables. And what's the benefit of that? Well, we looked as a city at several different things, and one option was early on to put up our own wind farm and find investors and, and then lease it back and then in eight to 10 years have a flip where we would own it. And then we would be selling electricity. And then we looked, John Deere Renewables came with this uh, proposal and for the financial condition of the city and where we were looking at down the road, this seemed to be the, well, it was the best option for Greensburg. When I look back at our ancestors that pioneered this area, they knew how to harness the wind, and they knew about geothermal to pump the water, and they knew about the sun so that they could pump the water up, heat it in a tower, and take a warm shower at night. The concepts are nothing new. When we look back at our heritage, we have the golden opportunity right now to be the new pioneers of the 21st century and take advantage of those concepts that our ancestors taught us. If you take care of the land, it'll take care of you. Hey, I'm as Republican as it gets, but I am as green as my shirt. When looking for advanced integrated energy systems, the obvious place to start is a brewery? This is the sixth largest brewery in the United States. By putting together half a dozen technologies, they're producing 85% of their energy needs under one solar roof. 
Every single part of our operation has some sort of environmental efficiency component to it. We have an on-site fuel cell system. It's a 1.2 megawatt system, and we have 1.9 megawatts of solar panels on-site, of PV panels. Uh, they produce a, a good portion of our electricity here for the plant. We've got uh, 10,000 solar panels here. 10,000? 10, 10,000 of them, yeah. I think wow. it's the, the largest privately owned installation in the U.S. as far as we know. Wow. It's a, a lot of solar produced power and it actually works very well with our, our demands because the fuel cells run 24 hours a day and at nighttime our, our requirements are much lower because we're not bottling and doing other things. So during the daytime when we've got sun is when our power needs are the highest. Conservation is a big part of our energy program. Just using what we're creating efficiently is a huge part of any energy program. So describe all the systems that you have working here. We recover heat throughout the process. We have plate heat exchangers throughout the brewing and production process. Uh, we have heat recovery systems at our brew kettles, at our boilers, at our fuel cells. Um, heat recovery is a great way to recover a hot exhaust, remove the energy from that and recycle it back into your process. What about carbon capture? We do have a CO2 recovery system that's recovering all of the CO2 produced naturally during the fermentation process. So as the little yeast molecules are converting sugars into alcohols, they're releasing CO2 at the same time. Instead of venting that greenhouse gas to atmosphere, we have a collection system to recover that clean it up, compress it, and then we're able to recycle that back into our production process. So these are tanks? These are tanks, yeah, these are full of beer. <laughs> Each of these tanks holds about 25,000 gallons of beer. 25,000 gallons, how many bottles is that? A lot. <laughs> More than you can consume in a lifetime, probably. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Well, what's your estimate of the total energy cost if you weren't using alternative energy? Um, well in excess of uh, $150,000 a month, so a couple million dollars a year. And what is it with, with the alternative energy? Uh, well, we're currently producing about 80% of our own electricity, so pretty much of a, a fraction of that. You know, we'll be paying 20% of, of our uh, typical electric bill. So you're consuming the equivalent of 150 grand worth of energy a month, but because of what you produce here, you only pay 30000 to the utility. Correct. In the best possible way, you seem like a tree hugger. Did you ever think you'd be working at a beer factory? I always hoped so. <laughs> I love beer. Whether it's building a more efficient grid or advancing concentrated solar, the question becomes, how do we get more of these solutions up and running? And the answer is twofold. Setting standards and policies and encouraging investment. Green technology is one of the biggest investment opportunities we've ever seen. We're used to investing in billion dollar market potentials and here we're seeing trillion dollar market potentials. The internet serves uh, you know, maybe about a billion people. Um, electricity and fuels serve on the order of four billion people. The, the internet was kind of a, uh, a sideshow compared to what we're about to see. The single biggest thing we need to do is to set ourselves challenging targets that reflect not only the ecological, but the economic reality that we need to invest in our own companies, in ourselves, and to show business that our long-term goal is toward a, low, toward a low carbon economy. In California, we've set emission standards for our vehicles, we've required cleaner fuels, uh, we've also required that uh, the uh, energy companies uh, generate electricity using the cleanest possible fuels. That's good policy because we all know where we're going. At the federal level, we have no energy policy. We have no requirements nationally for getting to renewable energy. And so that makes it very difficult to plan where we're going if we don't have policies. So if we can get policy right, America cannot be stopped. And we've got such amazing ingenuity here. We've got tremendous talent. I am convinced that if we can get the policy signals correct, that this problem, these problems of climate change and energy security can be solved. And I mean solved within the decade. When we say we're green investors, we're looking for those green dollar bills as our payment. We're not saying we're investing in anything because it's green and ecologically sound. That's nice. And that does 
play a role in that we know that those companies will have an easier time hiring employees and building their business. You do not need to be an environmentalist to, to see the green in green tech. The companies we've helped get started, they really are making meaningful impacts on people's lives, and so that is very rewarding as an investor. But we can't let that drive our decision making. But it definitely makes us feel better about our jobs and you know, we're cool with our kids again. <laughs> if you want to understand the direction that this industry is headed in, you want to look at which governments are creating the infrastructure, the R&D environments, uh, the incentives for clean energy industries to flourish, uh, whether in China or in South Korea or in the United States. And I think right now it's pretty clear that the big winners are going to be Asia. Uh, those governments are going to invest around $50 billion a year over the next 10 years. I think we'll be lucky if we invest about a fifth of that. If you choose to ignore this and hope it goes away, then you will ultimately need to be buying these technologies from countries and cities and businesses that have decided to go green. It's an investment that will pay for itself. As those industries get going, as they generate tax revenue for the federal government, it will more than pay for itself in the same way that our investments in pharmaceuticals, in aerospace, in personal computers, and the internet have paid off many, many times over. The subsidies that are in place for fossil fuels are really everywhere, and it's so much so that we don't even think about them anymore, but they absolutely change the game in ways that if we don't find these short-term subsidies for renewables, they simply won't be able to get in. Oil pumpers have all kinds of interesting ways they tap into government funding and protectionist uh, financing plans. It, it, the entire energy industry is, is rife with politics. Um, so it's, it's unfair to say, should there be none in energy and clean tech when it's all over the oil industry. The United States built much of its railroad system to bring coal from coal mines to power plants. That's a subsidy that's almost incalculably large in the market. Name a product out here that isn't subsidized. You can't name one. Whether it's cars, whether it's tractors, whether it's combines, whether it's food, um, that's what makes us work. It's actually remarkably simple. If you want to change the rules so that not only are new clean technologies benefited, but we do it in a way that's fair, we simply need to make all technologies pay for the degree to which they harm us as humans and the environment around us. And the most direct way to do that isn't to tax energy or to put a tricky price tag on energy, it's to tax pollution. We didn't win the space race with the Soviet Union by putting a tax on airplanes or jet airplanes to get a rocket. We just went out and built those things. We didn't have cap and trade on typewriters to get the personal computer. We didn't have a tax on the telegraph to get the internet. Uh, we, the government did those things directly. I think we're approaching that far too indirectly now for it to succeed. As individuals, we need to make sure the homes that we live in and the places that we work are efficient and we're using renewable energy. As government leaders, we need to pass the laws, fund the programs, and set the policies for clean energy. It's very simple. We don't have that many things that emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. I have the tailpipe of my car. I have maybe my lawnmower. Then there are power plants making electricity for me. So let's capture the carbon from those power plants. Let's give me an electric car, and I'll have a plug-in lawnmower, and we're done. In my lifetime, we have succeeded in eliminating most of the air pollution that was making our cities gray and ugly and making it hard to breathe. And we did that by setting strong standards, by pursuing good technologies, uh, technical solutions, and uh, we achieved great results. I now look at the issue of global warming as something that we can start working on right now and make a difference that will save California, maybe not in my lifetime, but in that of my children and grandchildren. Most of the experts we spoke with agree. We need to invest in building the things we already know how to build. Electric cars, clean energy like solar and wind, and efficiency throughout the system. Government can take the lead by creating policies and supporting the development of these innovations by creating and selling these clean energy solutions to the rest of the world, we can help prevent climate change globally while also boosting our economy here at home. We can and should do these things for our kids' sake and our own. We came into World War II flying biplanes 
and within five or six years, we had jet fighter planes. And so when we want to have a technological innovation and deploy something rapidly, if we feel there's enough of a threat, we can do it quickly. We know this market is going to be growing in these new energy technologies. America needs to be the country that is making them and selling them to the world. What are they going to say at the end of this 21st century about the people, not of Greensburg and Kiowa County, but the people of this earth? My vision is they're going to say they change their ways and they decide to take care of their environment.